China's former health minister related organ transplants to economic development and set a target for 2023. A new regulation made it easier for more hospitals to engage in carrying out organ transplants, triggering more concerns over ethics. The head of the CCP chose a new way to boost the economy, but is it promising? More regions across China are reporting new CCP virus cases. People continue to doubt the official figures. A top Airbnb executive resigned over concerns the company was sharing user data with China. And Tesla CEO Elon Musk claimed a Chinese car maker has stolen codes from Tesla and Apple. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Organ transplantation is supposed to save lives. But China's former deputy minister of health says the medical practice has another function to meet economic developments. China's former health minister Huang Jifu says the country's rapid development of organ transplantation still doesn't meet the needs of economic development. Adding that he hopes in three years China will perform the most organ transplants of any country in the world. His comments came last Friday during an organ transplant forum in Beijing. Huang is currently chairman of the Organ Transplant Development Foundation. He said that the United States carries out more than 30,000 organ transplants every year. And in line with the speed of economic development, the number done in China should increase to 50,000 a year. Ling Xiaohui, a Sydney-based Chinese affair commentator, said the actual number of organ transplants in China has already far exceeded 50,000. The number of organ transplants in China is actually much higher than in other countries such as the U.S. There is an international consensus that China has a huge underground human organ bank that provides organs from living bodies. They mainly come from Falun Gong practitioners and other detainees like ethnic minorities. According to Chinese media, this June, a Chinese girl living in Japan went back to China for a heart transplant. Within 10 days, a hospital in Wuhan had found three matching hearts that could be transplanted. Based on media reports, a patient in Japan usually has to wait around three years to get a heart transplant. The articles didn't explain why in China three hearts could be found for her within 10 days. Instead, the Chinese regime's media mouthpieces praised the case as a success story for China's medical system. Ling says he believes Huang is vigorously promoting the development of the country's so-called organ transplant industry only in order to cover up the illegal organ market. Reporting by Lu Ya, NTD News. And to go along with China's growing transplant market, China's National Health Commission issued a new regulation in August, making it easier for hospitals and doctors to enter the organ transplantation business. In recent years, China's extremely short wait times for organs has triggered international investigations into the unexplained abundance of its organ supply. The new, even looser regulation raises more concerns about the ethics of China's transplant market. Previously, only major hospitals that received the country's highest quality grade, namely grade A tertiary hospitals, were authorized to perform organ transplant operations. Authorized surgeons were also required to maintain their experience and skills. For example, a kidney surgeon would need to perform at least 800 urology operations annually, including 150 on kidneys, before being qualified for kidney transplant operations. But now these requirements have been replaced with easier to meet specifications. The new regulation also loosens restrictions on organ storage time, which directly affects transplant success rates. In the United States, even with over 100 million registered voluntary organ donors, the average wait time for a matching liver or kidney is between one to two years. In China, where voluntary organ donation is very rare due to cultural reasons, the wait time for a major organ is often no more than a month or even a week. A state-run Chinese media outlet recently reported a case where four candidate hearts were reserved for one patient within 10 days. Some Chinese hospitals even feature urgent care organ transplant clinics, boasting immediate type matching and surgery when required. Several independent investigations conclude that large-scale killing to order for transplant organs occurs in China, with the main victims being prisoners of conscience, like practitioners of the spiritual meditation discipline Falun Gong.
As the profiteering attracted more hospitals and doctors to the transplant business, the victim pool also expanded. Tibetans, members of the Uyghur ethnic group, trafficked women and children, homeless people, dissidents, and those who fall out of favor with the Chinese Communist Party are all potential victims of China's live organ harvesting practices. Human rights groups are expressing concerns that the loosened regulation provides legal cover and potentially encourages even larger scale killings for organs in China. And according to the New York-based World Organization to investigate the persecution of Falun Gong's latest report, large-scale organ transplantation has continued in China amid the virus pandemic. During some undercover investigations, medical staff in China have claimed that the transplant organs they use come from healthy Falun Gong meditators. First, we look to China's economy as it now faces a difficult situation. That's following the impacts of both the pandemic and the deterioration of U.S.-China relations. Many foreign companies have withdrawn or are set to withdraw from China. Fewer production orders coming from abroad. The so-called World's Factory, located in the southern city of Dongguan, has been virtually abandoned. China's economic progress can no longer rely on exports as much as before. Top officials from the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, appear to have shifted their hopes toward domestic demand as the driving force of the country's economy. The change follows CCP head Xi Jinping's new policy order months ago. A new term was also created to describe the situation, domestic economic cycle. It means China has to rely on robust domestic demand and innovation as the main driver of its economy. But last week, top CCP official Premier Li Keqiang seemed to indicate that there's still a long way to go. Li emphasized the need for rural consumption at an economic conference last week, explaining that lacking consumption will hinder China's economy. But the country's economic outlook appears less than promising. Severe flooding across China this summer, coupled with a range of natural disasters, has left Chinese farmers with a very poor crop yield. Some farmers have told us they've received little to no subsidies from the regime, leaving them without compensation for the damages. Data shows that Chinese people's spending power has also taken a hit. Premier Li Keqiang revealed earlier this year about 600 million people earn less than the equivalent of $150 per month. That amounts to more than 40 percent of China's population. At the same time, nearly 950 million people make a monthly income of less than $300, making up around 70 percent of the population. China's official figures show in the first eight months of this year, China's consumption growth dropped almost 9 percent compared to last year. And in September and October, the consumption rate saw moderate growth. But with CCP virus cases again surging across China, it's become even harder for Xi Jinping's new policy to be put into practice. China is seeing a surge of CCP virus cases, and more regions across the country are reporting new outbreaks. Now we turn to NTD's Don Ma, who has the story. Thanks, Tiffany. First, we turn to Shanghai, where in one airport, nearly 18,000 employees underwent virus testing on Sunday. This is after several cargo handlers were found to be infected. At the same time, a hospital has gone into lockdown. 4,000 of its employees are now in isolation. In Tianjin, a mega city next door to Beijing, the virus situation has also escalated. Based on a recent Chinese media report, one district in the city is said to test all of its residents. Authorities there aim to test the Binhai district's 2.6 million people in just three days. But the notably fast pace has called the quality of the testing into question. Authorities have already locked down several communities inside the district. The virus has already reportedly spread from the district to other nearby counties, Between them, six communities, two villages, and a food market were forced under urgent lockdown. Virus testing points have been set up while personnel in protective gear were spotted evacuating people inside the market. And in China's inner Mongolia, one city there is facing lockdowns after confirmed virus cases were discovered. The Epidemic and Prevention Control Headquarters in Manjuli City issued a notice saying local schools, kindergartens and training institutions will suspend teaching activities. Public venues are also suspended, and public security departments are implementing necessary road and traffic supervision measures. 
large-scale gatherings are also prohibited. And in China's Zhejiang province, a community of over 5,000 is being tested. This after a virus patient was tested positive. According to official figures, all of the more than 5,000 people tested negative, but these figures are doubtful because it's widely known that Chinese-made virus test kits have low accuracy. What this means is that the tests will almost certainly produce false positives. When thousands of people are being tested, it's statistically impossible to have an 100% negative rate. Back to you, Tiffany. Officials in Beijing are using a new study to suggest the pandemic originated from Italy, not China. The new study by the National Cancer Institute of Italy says the virus may have spread in that country last September, three months before Chinese authorities confirmed it was spreading in Wuhan. China previously also suggested Spain and France as being the origin of the pandemic, as well as blaming the U.S. military saying U.S. soldiers brought the virus to Wuhan during the military world games in October. Chinese official media are now strongly pushing the idea of the new study. However, a researcher of the Institute Giovanni Apollone told British newspaper The Times that the study doesn't imply that the virus originated from Italy. He said, we know that China delayed announcing its outbreak, so there's no telling when it started there. And China has very strong commercial links with northern Italy. One of China's vaccine candidates will start testing in late-stage human trials in Argentina and Chile. The co-founder of the pharmaceutical company CanSino Biologics Incorporated announced the news on Saturday. CanSino also agreed in October to supply 35 million doses of the vaccine to Mexico. China has four homegrown candidates currently undergoing phase three trials. None have so far produced interim results. A research paper was published last week on The Lancet, the world's best-known peer-reviewed medical journal, about another of China's vaccine candidates. It showed that trial data that suggested low effectiveness and side effects. The data is from phase one and two trials of Sinovac Life Sciences vaccine under the brand name of Coronavac. Sinovac is a Beijing-based biopharmaceutical company. The Lancet reports that the vaccine produced lower levels of antibodies than that of asymptomatic patients who had previously had the virus. And the overall incidence of adverse reactions was 38 percent in trial participants. Dr. Paul Offit is the director of the Vaccine Education Center at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and the co-inventor of the rotavirus vaccine. A Voice of America report quoted Dr. Offit's questioning of China's delay and data release, saying both Pfizer and Moderna have provided their data, and there's no reason for China not to do so. They should have been ahead of the U.S. companies. Director of Global Health Policy Center Dr. Stephen Morrison says the problem with Chinese vaccines is the lack of information transparency. There are currently two Chinese vaccines that still need to complete phase three trials. Yet massive vaccinations have already been carried out. No other countries dare to do so. Another coronavirus vaccine is showing promising results. AstraZeneca says its experimental vaccine is 70 percent effective on average. It showed 90 percent efficacy in one dosing regimen. That's when the vaccine was given as a half dose, followed by a full dose at least a month later. There was a 62 percent efficacy in a second regimen when two full doses were given at least a month apart. The vaccine was developed with the University of Oxford. It's the latest of several vaccine trials worldwide to post their results this month. And a news release, AstraZeneca said its vaccine is highly effective in preventing COVID-19. The drug makers said there were no hospitalizations or severe cases of the disease reported in participants receiving the vaccine. The United States and Taiwan stepped up economic ties over the weekend. The agreement falls short of a bilateral trade agreement, but it could help pave the way for one in the future. Taiwan and the U.S. are stepping up economic ties. The countries have agreed a five-year deal establishing the Economic Prosperity Dialogue that will be held annually. The U.S.-Taiwan economic dialogue signifies that not only is the United States-Taiwan economic relationship strong, but it continues to deepen and grow. Taiwan's Foreign Minister Joseph Wu said it's an important milestone. I think the most important substance is for 
Taiwan and the United States to identify those specific areas for us to work on together, for us to make concrete progress, for us to make concrete uh, cooperation. The Chinese Communist Party views Taiwan as its own territory, and it's criticized increasing ties between the United States and the island. It responded to the meeting by flying fighter jets across the Strait of Taiwan. Taiwan and the United States don't have a free trade agreement, but in August, Taiwan eased restrictions on imports of American beef and pork. This lowered the trade barrier and could set the stage for further trade negotiations. Last year, U.S. trade with Taiwan was estimated at nearly $104 billion. The U.S. has also started selling more advanced weaponry to Taiwan under the Trump administration. This includes a $2.4 billion sale of Harpoon missile systems announced in October. A top Airbnb executive resigned over concerns about the company's China ties. Sean Joyce was the former chief trust officer at Airbnb. According to a report by the Wall Street Journal, he stepped down from his post last year over concerns the company was sharing user data with China. Joyce says customers aren't aware the company often obeys the Chinese regime's data requests. Airbnb has told users it shares information with Chinese authorities since 2016. Despite that, Joyce felt most people aren't aware of the extent their information is shared. A spokesperson for the company told the Wall Street Journal the company complies with the data requests but doesn't share real-time data. When contacted by the Wall Street Journal, Joyce would only say he resigned over a difference in values. This comes as the company filed to go public. In the filing, Airbnb said it risked doing business in China if it doesn't comply with the data sharing requests. Tesla CEO Elon Musk claimed Chinese carmaker Xping has stolen old codes from Tesla's electric vehicles. He added that Xping also stole Apple's code. That's referring to the LiDAR technology that Xping is now using. The technology uses laser light to scan surroundings and create a digital map of its target. It's still unclear whether Musk's claim is true. But similar issues have also cropped up in recent years. Last year, a former Tesla engineer admitted to uploading Tesla's code to his iCloud account. The company sued him for sharing the code with Xping. And in 2018, a former Apple engineer was charged with stealing the company's technology. He, too, later worked for a China-based car maker. The head of the exiled Tibetan government was invited to visit the White House on Friday. The trip marked the first time in 60 years that an exiled Tibetan leader visited the White House. In July, the U.S. accused Beijing of violating Tibetan human rights. Since then, Chinese officials have accused the U.S. of using Tibet to promote so-called splitism in China. It refers to the idea of supporting group interests instead of official Communist Party policy. Chinese authorities have also refused to engage with the newly appointed U.S. Special Coordinator for Tibetan Issues. China seized control of Tibet in 1950, claiming that it was a peaceful liberation of its feudalistic past. But critics, siding with the exiled spiritual leader, the Dalai Lama, have compared Beijing's rule to cultural genocide. And in the UK, Britain has announced its largest military spending increase in three decades, releasing an almost $22 billion budget boost for the country's armed forces. The move mainly targets artificial intelligence, or AI techniques, and what's known as a Space Command, a department that will lead the country's space operations. The actions comes amid rising threats from China, Iran and Russia regarding cyber attacks. Earlier this year, the UK issued an alert about attacks on organizations developing CCP virus vaccines. It also warned about extensive Chinese attacks on UK systems that support working from home, designed to help people working remotely during the pandemic. The UK says it will invest in new space technology and aims to launch rockets by 2022. This would ensure the security of satellite communications and location systems. This after China and Russia put anti-satellite weapons into space. Britain's space capability currently lags behind that of the U.S., Russia and China. And that's all for today's China Info Kiss. Thanks for watching and see you tomorrow.